Good everyone and welcome to the Joint Committee on Veterans and Pu Federal Affairs fifth public hearing of the 2023-2004 legislative session. My name is John Velas and I'm the Senate Chair of this committee and I'm joined by my friend, Representative Jerry Cassidy, the House Chair of this committee. I want to thank all those for being present, both in person and virtually, for being here today and we're now calling this hearing to order. As is tradition at hearings of the Veterans and Federal Affairs Committee, I would like to begin by asking those in attendance who can and those participating virtually to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Now going to recognize the Senate members of this committee, Vice Chair Rush, Senator Brady, Senator Mark, and Senator Fatman. And I now would like to turn it over to my House Co-Chair, Representative Cassidy, for some opening remarks and to recognize the House Committee members who are with us. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the uh, House side, we have uh, the Vice Chairman, uh, Pete Capano, uh, Stel Rias. Um, she's coming back in. Uh, Representative Duffy, uh, virtual. Uh, Rodney Elliott, Representative Elliott. He's on virtual, and Kelly Pease, uh, who is next, to, next door, and uh, she will be back. Thank you. And Representative Ariaga just joined us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And today's hearing focuses on legislation related to veterans tax and annuity adjustments. The committee has also added several late files to the, the agenda that focus on other veterans benefits as well, including chapter 115, in a way that these types of resources are communicated to veterans across the Commonwealth. As we all know, there are a lot of important financial measures that our Commonwealth provides to our veterans and their family members and service members, whether that be property tax exemptions, annuities for disabled veterans and Gold Star families, or other forms of tax credits. And as we consider ways that our Commonwealth can continue to be the best place that a veteran can call home, we must look at these types of measures and how we can improve upon them. So I'm grateful for this hearing and the opportunity to hear testimony from folks on the many thoughtful measures before this committee today. Just a few housekeeping measures. This is obviously a hybrid hearing with participation both in person and virtually. Testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. And as is customary, the committee may take elected officials out of turn to testify as they arrive. If you're, today, if you're here today in person and have not yet registered to testify, you may do so by filling out the sign-in sheet with committee staff at the back of the hearing room. Written testimony will also be continued to be accepted by the committee and can be submitted via email. For members of the committee participating virtually, if you have a question, please use the raise hand feature on Teams or communicate via the chat to committee staff. I know that several of our legislative colleagues are with us today to testify in legislation. And so without further ado, I would now like to recognize Senator Keenan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chief Cassidy, Chief Viewers, and members of the committee. John Keenan, State Senate representing the Norfolk and Plymouth District. Uh, I want to thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today on um, Senate Bill 2356, filed by Senator Beals. Thank you for, for filing it. This is a, an act increasing annuity for disabled veterans and Gold Star families. Uh, for a long time, we have attempted to increase the annuity that would apply not only to Gold Star families, but also those who disability. Uh, there were attempts back when we passed the Ballot Act back in 2013 and then subsequent um, attempts to do it and culminating with the filing this year of Senator Beals' bill. So again, thank you for doing that. Um, just coming off of Veterans Day, we certainly are reminded again, as we should be every day, of the importance of veterans and all that they've done for this country. And as we are out and about on Veterans Day, you do run across uh, Gold Star families families who um, have lost loved ones in the, on the battlefields all across the, the world. And um, while that's generally uh, remembrance that's saved from Memorial Day, again, it was highlighted during Veterans Day that there are families who um, deal with the loss of loved ones. And so what this would do would um, increase the current annuity, which was set back in 2006 from $2,000 to to, uh, to $3,000. As you know, the governor has filed the HERO Act and sets the amount to $2,500, but I honestly do believe the Senate of this approach is, is the better approach. Um, we know <coughs> that there has been increased 
costs of health care, education, housing, and other necessities, and we must ensure that Gold Star families uh, receive adequate benefits. So again, this legislation increases it to $3,000, and it's important to note, as I mentioned briefly, that this bill also impacts veterans who are determined to be 100% disabled. It increases, increases the annuity to $3,000 as well. A similar version of this legislation was reported out favorably last session, and I respect the request that the committee consider doing so. Again, helping Gold Star families maintain financial security is the least we can do to support those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect us. So I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the <coughs> opportunity to, to express support for this bill and ask that it be given a favorable recommendation. And, and anything that I can do to help you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Chair, and others, I'm happy to do it. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment of personal privilege, if I may. Um, a veteran of the city of Quincy named Larry Norton was a big proponent of this legislation and was behind early attempts to increase the Gold Star annuity from $2,000 to, to, to 2500 Larry passed away, and I know that one of the things, because he expressed it to me, that he regretted was that he couldn't get this bill through and that we couldn't increase it to what he thought was an amount that uh, was truly reflective of, uh, respective of the service of our Gold Star families and their losses. So I think of him today as I testify here, and again, thank you for your consideration of this bill. Question from the committee. Yes. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, not a question, just a thank you. I am a Gold Star father. So we lost our son in the war, and we understand what it's all about. And for you and that gentleman to stick to it and do the right thing, we appreciate it very much. Right. And I appreciate that. But in all, in all deference, um, the Senator here has been in our body, um, has taken up this cause. And I'm happy to follow it, quite frankly, um, but it is, and I thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And then, Senator Keeney, just thank you. Since I've been in the Senate, you've been a stalwart ally of anything involving veterans, their causes, and advocacy. So thank you for your collaboration on this, and we will certainly be talking about it as we progress. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Have a great day. S Senator Cronin. And it's a panel. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the committee, Chair Cassidy, Chair Vilas. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on uh, this bill that we have filed that really, I believe, ensures that Massachusetts continues to lead across the country in how we take care of our veterans at the state level. Um, over the past year, uh, my office has had the privilege to work with uh, kind of an, an informal team of teams and a number of stakeholders who are leaders in the Commonwealth on veterans' issues. But joined with me today uh, is Dan Nagan from the Legal Services Center at Harvard Law School, Anna from Veterans Legal Services, and we've also been cl uh, working closely with the Mass Law Reform Institute uh, to make sure that we're delivering through the 115 program uh, the best possible safety net that we can here at the state level uh, and also bring chapter 115 into the 21st century uh, and also especially in light of us moving out of the post 9 11 perhaps expanding the definition of veteran in massachusetts to reflect the sacrifice of uh, our guard our reserve members and how they have contributed over the past uh, 20 plus years of war uh, here in the nation and uh, and making sure that we're doing everything we can for them here in the Commonwealth. So with that, I'd like to uh, defer to the rest of my panel to, to jump into different components of the bill. And we also joined by a veteran virtually who uh, will close us off. Thank you, Senator Cronin. And thank you, Chair Vilas and Chair Cassidy and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Anna Richardson. I am the co-executive director at, at Veterans Legal Services. And our mission is to help Massachusetts veterans overcome adversity by providing free civil legal aid that honors their service, promotes well-being, and responds to their, to their distinctive needs. 
I'm here to testify in support of an act to modernize Chapter 115, uh, Senate Bill 2489. Massachusetts has a long and proud history of supporting its veterans, and we applaud the Governor and Secretary Santiago for their initiative to expand access to benefits and services. We also urge you to do more to modernize the delivery of this critical assistance to veterans and their families. Reform is needed to ensure that the administration of Chapter 115 benefits is brought into the 21st century, that benefits are administered consistently across municipalities, and that we bring it up to comparable administrative standards of other assistance programs. Some of the critical matters this bill would address include standards for timely hearing decisions at all levels. Uh, as it currently stands, there are no time standards for issuing decisions when a veteran appeals a denial or reduction of benefits. And while I want to recognize the recent efforts by the Secretary and his team to clear a significant backlog that was not of their making, um, we still have seen veterans wait too long, over, uh, over a year in at least one of our cases, to receive an appeals decision. Um, we also need to reform an archaic and overly punitive overpayment system. Chapter 115 is the only benefits program in the Commonwealth where a small amount of overpayment can form an insurmountable bar to receipt of benefits. Um, a few years ago, we represented a veteran who was told he could not receive benefits due to an overpayment as small as $85. Rather than take that payment out of his first check or issue a waiver, the VSO simply denied his application outright. He missed months of payments before he came to us where we helped him reapply and get the overpayment waived. Um, asset limits, work incentives, and certain payments such as the annuity should be indexed to the cost of living. We urge you to adopt the common practice of the VA, Social Security, and many other agencies which tie these amounts to the consumer price index so they're automatically updated each year for Chapter 115 recipients. Inflation hits hardest on those with the least resources and administration of the program should reflect that reality. Um, benefits should be provided in a manner that reflects modern economic systems and honors the recipient's privacy and dignity. We hear time and time again from our clients how hard it is for them to ask for help. Veterans do come forward and ask for assistance and then are forced to either come in person to pick up a paper check or in some communities we still hear there are reports of being told they need to wait in line on a particular day. Uh, a practice that uh, our clients report causes them to feel ashamed about asking for assistance. Uh, veterans should also not be required to provide more information than is necessary to verify eligibility. Yet current practice is, required, is to require applicants to sign blanket release forms that authorize their VSO to contact, among others, their gym or health club, their public library, their former spouse or parent of their child, retail establishments, child care providers, and many others, far more sweeping than any other public assistance program. And finally, we could take many steps to reduce silos across agencies. And Massachusetts has already done this by um, trying to reduce the burden on economically disadvantaged individuals by authorizing the development of a common application for means-tested assistance. However, Chapter 115 was left out of this effort. Adding 115 to the common application would ensure veterans will benefit from the same no wrong door approach in connecting them with benefits and services we are striving to provide to those who have not served accessing other programs. This is especially critical when a VSO is not available or the veteran cannot access the VSO due to their work schedule or perhaps because it's a, a part-time VSO in a smaller community. Um, so these are just some of the critical updates this bill would take to make this vital safety net resource more available to veterans and their families. And we urge you to support this legislation because every veteran, regardless of their zip code, deserves to receive the same access to benefits and services and to have those benefits and services provided in a way that honors their service, their dignity, and their humanity. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon uh, to the chairs and to the committee, and thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about the needed reforms in the Chapter 115 program. My name is Daniel Nagan, as the Senator indicated. I direct the Veterans Legal Clinic at the Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center of Harvard Law School. We provide free legal assistance to low-income veterans from across the Commonwealth in a host of civil practice areas, and we have over a decade of experience advocating for veterans uh, in the Chapter 115 program who encounter barriers and gaps to getting the support they desperately need. I want to acknowledge at this point uh, a, a veteran that we've been very privileged to work with, who I believe is on our Zoom 
uh, Mr. Michael Mimna, and Mr. Mimna will talk uh, in a little bit more detail about some of the experiences that veterans can go through. I'm going to focus on a couple of key points about the overall structure of the program, and in doing so, I want to emphasize that a lot of people in the, in the Commonwealth are concerned about veterans and are trying to do the right thing, VSOs, EOVS, uh, the advocacy community, the State House, and I think the tools are not quite there yet to get it right and to meet, reach all the veterans who need help and survivors and dependents, and so that's what this proposed legislation is about, bringing it into the 21st century so we all have the right tools. So uh, my colleague uh, from Veterans Legal Services mentioned a couple things about online eligibility, being able to uh, uh, make the program much more accessible by not having as many hurdles around documentation and needless releases of information. I want to emphasize one point that my colleague mentioned because it's worth uh, underscoring. The common application. How is it and why is it that the one community excluded from the common application could possibly be veterans? How could that be? That needs to be, and our bill addresses that, uh, that needs to be rectified as soon as possible. The second point I want to emphasize uh, deals with expanding access uh, for veterans and dependents who are actually in sometimes the greatest distress and most need help. So as noted by the senator, uh, the bill uh, revises eligibility to ensure that disabled reservists and National Guard members can receive the benefits they deserve. And as the committee well knows, the Guard and Reserves bore an inordinate brunt of the recent conflicts. And we need to make sure that we're taking care um, of our uh, guard and reserve in the Commonwealth. Um, the other thing is there's been excellent legislative progress, as you know, and no doubt have supported in ensuring that veterans who may have an other than honorable discharge because of discrimination against people who are LGBTQ+, that, that the Commonwealth needs to take the lead there and ensure that those veterans are given access to Chapter 115 benefits. But that's a beginning point. It can't be the ending point. There are many, many more veterans who may have a less than fully honorable discharge because of combat stress, traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, and we need to expand the definition of veteran to ensure that we're reaching all of those veterans who have higher rates of homelessness, higher rates of unemployment, and overall higher rates of distress. Last, I want to say that all of these goals, they're only going to be achievable if we marry this with an effort, and part of the legislation proposes this, to improve communication and outreach to potentially eligible veterans and their families. There's a giant gap, the so-called Chapter 115 in between, between the number of uh, Bay Staters who could and need help and who are actually getting help. And we need to close that gap through affirmative duties on the part of EOVS and VSOs to do outreach and communication. Many are already doing it, but it needs the legislature's uh, firm uh, momentum and support in order to ensure that it achieves its ends. I'm very grateful for the uh, committee's time and concern about this important issue. And if I would, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Mimna, who's online. Thank you. Anybody you hear me? We can. No. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. The State House can hear me. Okay. My name's Michael Mimna. I was uh, out at the State House over a year ago when I was made homeless by my VSO, along with other circumstances, and uh, couldn't find anybody who knew that the young lady sitting at the table that Daniel's at was somebody I could go talk to. I have an advocate that worked for me and we found Daniel and his students at the Harvard School of Law. My VSO was making me jump through hoops, and after I jumped through them all and didn't run away like many veterans that I know had left because it was too much for them to handle the stress and the bureaucracy, after I did that, he made me jump through more hoops, and that continued until I finally brought it to Daniel. The same thing was put on Daniel and his team. The VSO would not comply to the uh, Boston Veterans Office to uh, pay the veteran and the other veterans that were shut off illegally. And it's a shame that a 
VSO can do that, and there's nobody in the state house that checks on them, which is why I went to the state house, and nobody could help me. They said I had to be a teachers union or a city employees union or a police or a fireman that a single individual could not bring up uh, a state request uh, to look into a town. In 2018, our numbers were at a half a million almost. And with a new VSO and a new town manager, we're under 50,000 and going down to 20 veterans. So that's a sin that a VSO can do that. And um, I've been taken care of by Daniel and his team. And um, I look forward to working with other veterans and helping them in their assistance of Chapter 115. And I thank you all for everything that you do to help everybody in the Commonwealth, but our veterans especially. I was shut off on Veterans Day in 2021. So it's a little shameful that uh, a VSO who was a veteran and still is, uh, is in a position along with the uh, friends in the town hall that I was living in, that they're trying to reduce uh, chapter 115 to a, a zero. And that's uh, a bloody shame. I thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, sir. And very sorry that was your experience with your, with your VSO. Questions from the committee? So I'm just gonna say this. First, thank you for taking the time, however long ago that was, to, to meet with me via Zoom. Senator Cronin, thank you for your service, obviously. Thank you for your leadership on this. And, and I think we talked about this at the meeting. There's nothing that drives me more crazy than when a constituent reaches out to, to my office, and I know this has happened with several colleagues, and you say, have you spoken to your, to, your, to your VSO? And it's, what's that? I don't know what that is. Um, so to your point about the public awareness piece of this, that drives me absolutely crazy. And I, and I think another thing that's worth repeating too, and I've said this multiple times and I'm gonna continue to say it, every VSO is not created equally. Right? There's many that go above and beyond and some that don't. And I think that's just the reality of the world in any, in any profession. It's not, a, it's not a slight against anybody. Um, you raise a lot of good points. The common application, why was, why was this left out of it? Um, the robust nature of what's needed in terms of documents, um, the 85, whatever dollar amount we said was, that's, that's just, that's incredibly problematic to me. And I think there is wide agreement that 115 really needs to be looked at. I know the governor has indicated in the HEROES Act this and other things, and I can assure you this committee will do that due diligence with this. Um, so thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you for your testimony today and looking forward to continuing this dialogue with you. Thank you. Rep. Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you for taking me out of order, and thank you to the staff for doing it the last minute. Of course, I did not ask before the deadline. I was late, but I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, this is uh, my bill, H3506, is also about Chapter 115, but from a slightly different uh, viewpoint. Uh, I'm on a panel with Michael Proya and Paul Dumouchel. Michael is a veteran who lives in Attleboro Housing, and Paul is the director of Attleboro Housing. And they brought this to me last year. And I, I would have to take this to be an oversight that Chapter 115 would be counted as income, thus raising the rent in, in public housing. There's a whole list of exclusions. And I think it's just an oversight because not every veteran gets Chapter 115. And they didn't think of it when they, when they uh, wrote the rules on this. Uh, I'm going to let them speak more because they can speak more as to how it impacts them. But it seems that a veteran who is receiving Chapter 115 is the person who needs it the most, and it should not uh, it, it should not 
raise their rent. It's like they're getting money in one hand and giving it back in the other. And for the veterans involved, uh, there should be, I believe, and I'm not looking at your roster here, there should be somebody from the Adel the VSO from Attleboro, would be Ben Quayle, testifying how it affects on his end. It makes sort of a seesaw when one goes up, the other goes down. And also Bill LeBeau and Mike Raymond from the Veterans Organization. But in my panel, and I'll defer my time to, uh, I'm going to slide it over next to, to Mike Froya, who is the veteran who brought this to my attention. We filed this last year, but it was a late file, so I didn't have any expectations. But it seems like kind of a no-brainer that we could get through this time. So I appreciate your your uh, indulgence. Here's here's Michael. Yep. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Michael Proyer. I am a Vietnam-era U.S. Navy veteran. I first found out about the Attleboro Veterans Services Department after being referred to them by the Reverend Larson Senior Center here in Attleboro. I was told that they could help me cover the cost of a better medical insurance plan. Due to my medical needs after open heart surgery, co-pays and other expenses under the plan I had were making it difficult for me financially. After assisting me with finding coverage they that would eliminate these co-pays and other medically related expenses that was straining my ability to cover my month-to-month -month necessities, I was directed to contact the Attleboro Veterans Services Department in City Hall to help me with the costs of this new medical insurance. It was the lifeline I needed. Veterans Services explained the program to me and provided me a letter stating that this benefit is considered non-reportable income and breaking down the amount of my benefit to cover the cost of my medical insurance and an amount intended to keep veterans above the poverty level, which they referred to as ordinary expenses. I have lived in public housing for approximately 14 years, and I am thankful for every day of it. Without them, I don't know where I would live because I would not be able to afford the rent and utilities being asked for an apartment today in Massachusetts. Every year I submit my current income paperwork during the annual rent determination period for the upcoming year. A couple of years ago, I noticed a significant increase in my rent, far exceeding the stated 30% of my Social Security retirement income. When I questioned this, I was told that the Attleboro Veterans Service benefit I was receiving is now being included when calculating my new rent. This was going to have a significant impact on my financial resources. So I questioned it with the Housing Authority because I don't understand how the state of Massachusetts provides a non-reportable benefit to its veterans excuse me, so they may pay for adequate medical insurance benefits along with an amount that would ease someone from falling below the poverty level, only to have a different state of Massachusetts agency take away a portion of that benefit to go towards state subsidized housing. I mean, doesn't that go against the intended purpose of the benefit, Veterans Benefit Program? I am here today because I have had several major operations and continue to be seen by several different doctors. I do not have the ability to work because of my age and medical issues. Loss of this income provided by the state agency for veterans only to have a state agency for housing take a portion of it would have a significant impact on my quality of life and again make it more difficult to keep up with today's high cost of food gas and personal needs in closing i would just like to read one sentence from the letter the city of massachusetts department of veterans services gives me explaining the breakdown of my benefits this receipt of veteran services benefits under chapter 115 constitutes a public assistance grant and may be excluded from countable income 
for the purposes of other public assistance programs subject to conflicting regulatory guidelines. Paul Dumichel, the director of the Alboro Housing Association, made an important observation and suggestion this morning to me, which I completely agree with. Uh, all that needs to be done to rectify this situation is to change the word may to will. And all of this would take care of itself. It's, <clears throat> excuse me again, take care of itself. I thank you for your time and I hope you will take this into consideration. Sir, thank you very much. Thank you, you, Michael. And next next on the panel in the room next to us here on a different computer is Paul Dumouchel. I would say that this takes a village. Paul and Michael uh, and Ben, who's the VSO in Attleboro, worked together with me to get this legislation. And so I'm I'm just the voice, I'm just their voice on this. But uh, uh, Paul, Paul is in the other room, he'll click on. Thank you very much, Representative Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Senator Vilas and, and Representative Cassidy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, over a year ago, when um, when Michael Proyer brought this to my attention, um, I I totally agreed with him that uh, that this income uh, that is provided to veterans from the VSO um, should should not be counted as income, and I I would have to agree that it that it was an oversight and. Um, and I wanted just to, you know, come at this from from a housing agency point of view. Um, we have a number of veterans in our in our housing portfolio, and um, I don't have to tell you know anybody on this panel, uh, you know, the challenges that everybody faces nowadays with uh, with the price of food and gas and and rent and so forth. You know, public housing is a, is an opportunity to, you know, live in a very affordable apartment. Uh, you know, paying roughly 30% of, of your income to rent, uh, you know, you know, to the housing authority. And um, uh, Michael brought it to my attention that um, um, it's an inherent um, unfairness, uh, you know, which I, you know, I tended to agree with. Um, I referred him to Representative Hawkins, and uh, we've sort of worked together to advance this. And um, I just want to thank the panel for the opportunity to appear and to wholeheartedly endorse, um, you know, this portion of the bill. And I also want to thank Mike Proya uh, for for his service to our country. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the committee? Again, just I'll repeat what I said earlier. Chapter 115 is something that we are taking a very hard look at this session. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Apologize that you had to go through some of what you had to go through and um, looking forward to continuing this dialogue. Thank you very much. So, so Bill LeBeau is not in my panel, but he is he just texted me. He is online ready to testify on the same bill. Please. He's an adjutant. You may know him from the State House. Please, by all means. Thank you. So, good afternoon, Senator Villas, Representative Cassidy. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I am going to be on a panel with the VFW shortly, but uh, on this bill, when it first got brought to our attention last year, the VFW is so behind this that actually co I signed my name to it with Representative Hawkins. We really feel strongly this is something that has to be um, addressed. And given the environment right now with the limited housing that we have in the state, we really feel that this is something the legislature should really fix. So thank you for your time on this. Thank you, Mr. LeBeau. Obviously, the, the voice of the VFW is something that this committee does not take lightly. So thank you for your willingness to come forward today. Questions? Committee? All righty. Next up, we have Chrissy Lynch at House Bill 4021. Dear Chair Bayless, Chair Cassidy, and members of the committee, um, thank you for your sacrifice. Uh, thank you for your service. Um, I was just reading about you this morning, uh, Chair Bayless. Um, my name is Christy Lynch. I'm the president of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, where we represent over 800 local unions across the state from every sector. 
Um, among, those member, among those members are thousands of veterans and thousands of family members of those serving in the military. We want to register our strong support for House 4021, an act requiring employers to post information on veterans' benefits and services. This is a common sense bill that would simply require standardized workplace postings that include basic information about veteran services, rights, benefits, and programs, and how veterans can seek resources and get help right away. Veterans deserve both well-rounded and accessible resources, as well as jobs that provide family-sustaining wages, secure benefits, and a dignified retirement. They need a pathway to success that will help them leverage the skills they gained in, they gained in the armed forces. We are so proud of the programs our unions run to connect veterans to life-changing careers in the union movement, like the Helmets to Hard Hats program, which eases the, the passage back to civilian life. For those veterans who have come home and are already working, we must make it as easy as possible for them to access vital information about the really critical resources available to them as veterans. This is a service we can provide to veterans and workers at a very minimal cost to employers in the Commonwealth. Our veterans deserve to come home to the promise of a meaningful career and economic opportunity. We applaud the United Steelworkers Union for being a national leader on this issue, pushing this bill in every state and getting some real momentum. We'd like to see Massachusetts be a leader in this, like we are in so many other things to protect workers and veterans. So I hope you will please report this bill out of your committee favorably and swiftly. And thank you once again for your public service. Thank you. Questions? I, I would just say, I would just say thank you. Um, you mentioned, I was gonna say this, the helmets, the hard hats, and then just the number of times that I hear about you know, things being posted in the, in the mental health and substance abuse space, which obviously impacts, the, impacts everyone, but certainly has a pronounced impact on our veteran population. Mm -hmm. And I always see unions kind of really reaching out and leading on that. So, so thank you, Rep, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I think I are, yeah, please. Just one thing, I just want to thank uh, Representative uh, Capano for this, and uh, um, uh, Madam President, uh, thank you for being here to testify. And this is, this is basically a no-brainer to me. Um, this should be put up in uh, all businesses throughout the whole uh, state. How many uh, other states have this, do you know, roughly? Let me look at you guys. Yeah, someone that's going to testify to that. Oh, okay. It could be international. There's a national campaign right Right, now. right, yeah. 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 But we don't do up for sure. Yeah. yeah. We were very surprised to learn it wasn't already the law. Right. You know? and, and, and you can tell that by the uh, cosign uh, the, yeah. on the House bill that you know, Re Reverend McGonagall and there's an awful lot of uh, very good, good uh, solid people on, on board. So thank you very much. Thank you. I don't, not to put you on the spot, but you, sir, you just referenced New York. Do we know when New York did this? When? Yeah. Last year. Last year. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Right, of course, thank you. Thanks, Rep. Thanks, Rep. You, you want to come forward? Please. Yeah, I just I want to thank uh, Chris Lynch for her testimony here. Uh, I just want to advocate for the bill. I think it's, uh, like Chair Cassidy said, it's a no-brainer. Uh, as we work to do more for our veterans and improve for services, there are a lot of services that are available that people don't even know about. So th this would really help that out. And there's some advocates here. I want to thank the Steelworkers Union and uh, some VSOs that do a great job from Lynn and Watertown that are also here in support of, of the bill and hoping for a favorable outcome. Thank you. Thanks for bringing this forward. Chair, if I may. Please. Um, Rep, I think we have one question for you. Uh, or a question, question if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Rep, this is a no-brainer. Chair Cassidy is right. Um, and I was here when some of the uh, union members came and visited my office. It's, it's such a no-brainer. It should happen. Do you know any reason why it wouldn't? Uh, well, I think if, I don't want to think about that. I, I try to be, I'm like a glass full kind of person. Yes. Here, and I kind of think that with the support of the committee and uh, strong advocates here that we may have a good chance to get this through. That's, you know, that's sort of how I look at it. Amen. Uh, Thank you, sir. Happy to help. No. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Next up, we have the longtime chair of this committee, Senator Rush.
<laughs> thank you for your service and thank you for your testimony here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. And uh, as a member of the committee, I'm bouncing around from committee to committees today. It's one of those days, as we all know. But I wanted to come in uh, first and foremost to thank you. Uh, the commitment from this committee helping our veterans across the Commonwealth of Ma Massachusetts is invaluable. And I've seen it firsthand and know that the, conti the tradition continues each and every day as you hear testimony and work tirelessly to improve the lives of our veterans and their families. So I certainly appreciate that. I'm here to testify in favor of a few bills today. Again, as a member of the committee, I will advocate on that end, but I feel they're so important I wanted to testify as I leave here and go to uh, the Committee on Education after this. But I'm here in favor of uh, Senate Bill 2342 an act relative to tax credits for homeless veterans housing, uh, which would direct the Department of Housing to develop a qualified allocation plan and to set aside no less than 10% of its allocated tax credits to support projects to provide permanent housing for formerly homeless veterans. Senate Bill 2344, an act relative to veterans annuities for surviving spouses, which would update Chapter 115 benefit uh, benefits language to include the phrase surviving spouses in receipt of dependent indemnity compensation is awarded by Veterans Administration. And lastly, uh, Senate Bill 2347, an act relative to dependent eligibility for Chapter 115 benefits. And this would expand the definition of a dependent of a veteran eligible to receive Chapter 115 benefits to include those dependents who meet all eligibility requirements to receive benefits, uh, also being supported by the MVSOA. Um, and again, I'm here today uh, knowing the great work that gets done here by you, Mr. Chairman, and you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the committee each and every day. And you know, I know the momentum is strong as we advocate on behalf of our 380,000 veterans and their families our gold star families, and I just want to say thank you for the outstanding job that this committee does under your leadership and the members of this team, so thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your service, for your current service as the vice chair, as your longtime service as the chair. So much of this work that we've done in the Commonwealth has been under your purview um, with these issues. You're obviously go to for all of us. Questions, members of the committee? Thank you very much. I certainly appreciate it, and uh, again, I'm remiss that I'm not joining you, but I mm -hmm. need to go next door to the Education Committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Have Chairman. A, Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Neil Crowley, Joseph Endicott, Paul Morenci, and Tracy Gagliardi, House Bill 4021. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and the committee for hearing me. My name is Paul Morenci. I'm a lifelong resident of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, with the exception of the time I spent in the service. I'm a member of the United Steel Workers and a 12-year veteran of the United States Army, Army Reserve. To be able to represent the two things I love, my union and my brothers and sisters who wore the uniform is an honor. When most people think of veterans, the first thing that comes to mind is the mentally and physically disabled veterans, which is a good thing. They need the most help and assistance to get their lives back together and on track, and they have earned our undying gratitude. But there are many veterans who made it through the service unscathed, but through the grace of God. Let me talk about those veterans for a moment. When you are discharged from the military service, whether it be from a combat deployment, an overseas posting, or a state-sized posting, you're dealing with a large amount of paperwork. You're signing off on pay records, medical records, and turning all of your gear in and organizing your travel home. Most of the time, these men or women are in their early to mid-20s and just thinking about seeing their significant other, their family, and thinking about going to the local establishment and having a beer with their friends and getting on with their life. 
In that moment, you're in peak physical shape and feeling invincible, so you're half listening as they go over the benefits that you've earned. Fast forward a few years, now you have a spouse and a child on the way, and you decide you want to better yourself through education, buy a home, etc. But you can't remember where or how to access the benefits that you've earned. This is a problem. <laughs> the benefits the veteran earns are paid for by the taxpayer, and the programs are run by the government. The benefits are out there, but get unused due to veterans not knowing how to get started. These benefits include, but are not limited to pensions, education services, insurance programs, first time home buyer loans, and employment help, etc. Now the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is great in that each city and town has a Veterans Affair advocate in it, but many veterans are also unaware of that. Bill H4021, if passed, would require workplaces to have a posting with a list of verified phone numbers and websites that would allow veterans or their family members to get this information. As we know, we're just like anything else in this world, there are many unscrupulous websites and people out there looking to take advantage of veterans and their families. So having these verified listings would be a big help in getting the veterans the benefits they earned and the help they need. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to speak and please support Bill H4021 and the other great veterans bills that have been placed before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the chair and the committee for hearing us today on this bill. My name is Tracy Gagliardi. I'm here to represent the United Steel Workers Union and I'm also here as Tech Sergeant Gagliardi from the US Air Force, 102nd Security Forces Squadron uh, down in Cape Cod. I'm currently on state activated duty um, on a mission down there, down the Cape. I come from a military family. My dad was a Marine, my brother Army, my son now is a Marine, and currently I'm serving in the Air Force. When this bill was presented, it really hit home for me. My dad had struggled with his finances, PTSD from Vietnam and health over the years before he passed in 2019. He was old school, no idea who to talk to, what numbers to call, and what he was even entitled to. This bill would certainly help his generation to find all the information that they need. My dad, being an older generation, had no idea what his benefits were or what he was entitled to. When he passed, my mom had no idea what she was entitled to. To me, that isn't fair. A man who served 17 years in the military deserves to know what his benefits are. Having this posting makes it easier for our service members, past, present, and future. Let's be honest, we're in an era now where conflict is inevitable. We are sending our brothers and sisters, sons, daughters, to fight for our country. Let's make it easy for them to transition back into civilian life. Make it easy for them to get the benefits they are entitled to and what they fought for. Coming home from deployment or war isn't an easy transition for most. Seeing things that the average person doesn't see or doing things the average person doesn't do makes it a hard transition back into the civilian lifestyle. When our troops raise their right hand and take that oath of enlistment, right there they lose their freedom, whether it be four years, six years, or even 30. They sacrifice their entire life, family, holidays, birthdays, graduations, weddings, births, the, li the list goes on. They sacrifice everything to protect this country. The least we can do is put a posting up so they can easily access the help that they need. Thank you, and I appreciate you guys hearing us on this. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Cassie, Chair Vilas, and the rest of the committee for hearing us today and ask for a favorable report out of committee on H4021. My name is Joe Wendicott and I'm a member of the USW 1202-04 and a gas worker at National Grid. I've worked at National Grid for 16 years and I've been a union official for the past 10 of them. I would like to talk about this bill today and ask for your support uh, on what we feel is very important. And this bill would require employers of 50 or more to post a basic um, information in their workplace regarding services that veterans have earned and um, are designed to help them and their families. You can see the example from New York that uh, I handed out and it's just basic information. Uh, in my role as a union official, I can't tell you how important it is to have access to information, but to get our members also the right information. This posting would do just that for our veterans in the workplace. It would 
uh, be basic information such as phone numbers and websites that provide crucial services and benefits that are very much needed. A lot of this information people are not aware of either and it is very hard to track down on your own. Having a standardized informational posting is an easy way to provide vets with information and access to these benefits that they have earned. I can hope you support this bill and our veterans as they have supported all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Neil Crowley with the United Steelworkers Local 12012. Uh, thank you to the chair and committee for the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 4021. Uh, this bill could be so important to our brothers and sisters who have served in the military and are now back in the workforce. I've been a union official at my job for the past 10 years. Uh, part of my job is to educate members of the benefits available to them. And I can tell you from experience, when there is an official poster on the wall at work, something I can bring someone to and know that the information I am giving them is legit, it's been vetted, uh, it makes a big difference. There needs to be a standardized workplace posting that can help veterans and their families easily access the benefits they have earned and deserve. There are bulletin boards at work already. These benefits and services already exist. Uh, this would be incredibly helpful to veterans like Paul and Tracy and other brothers and sisters who are returning to the workforce. Uh, we need legislators to keep pushing this, please, and, and get it done. It's a win for everyone involved. Thank you, and please report on this favorably. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Please, Rep. Dora. Thank you, Chairman. Powerful testimony. This should be done. It should have been done years ago. It's shocking that it's not. Um, so I just thank you. My dad is, uh, was military, my grandfather, my son. Uh, tech sergeant, what a family. You said your father's Marine, your son is a Marine. You're a tech sergeant in the 102nd. Well, I represent Cape Cod and Joint Base Cape Cod. Yes. Yes, I was. Yes. So, uh, Master Sergeant Giamarco's retirement. So it's personal to me and all of us. And I just really wanted to let you know that. And, uh, and thank you for your service. It's time that we show it. This needs to pass. And it, <laughs> Chair, I know both of, all of us agree, and this is one that seems to be easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you. I just want to uh, thank you very much for this, Ed. We're uh, just looking through this. We went through the Q uh, QR code. And, yeah. Uh, just, the, just the information you just had, uh, that's what we should do here in Massachusetts. Yeah. Awesome. So, thank you. Paul, I think you said, I think it was you that said it about the, I can really identify with the, and I, I don't want to mess up how you said it, but a lot of, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems with this is, and I vividly recall coming home from deployment, and you know, you're, you're given this information you know, at a point in time yeah. when you're, you're just, your mind is elsewhere. It's, right. I want to go see my family. I want to I wanna go for a ride in my car, whatever, whatever it may be, the, the comforts of life. And, and I just remember, you know, that stuff just going, like, yeah, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. No, I don't life. care what you're saying. I just want to get out of here. So thank you for bringing that up. And I share my colleague's sentiment on um, I don't like it when a sister state does something before us in this space. That's so right. I appreciate you um, bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have Carrie Eldridge virtually. Good, good afternoon, Chair and Committee. How are you? Um, my name is Kerry Aldridge. I am with United Steelworkers. I'm an international staff rep. Uh, and, and before you, uh, you've heard some testimony, and, and most of that testimony that you've heard is, is what, what I was going to say. So from that, I, I instead, I would like to give you an example. Yes, uh, here in New York, this, this, was the, uh, this was passed a year ago. And part of that founding reason, um, if I may give you an example, of how this would benefit. Uh, one of my coworkers, a husband was, was a Vietnam era veteran, uh, ended up taking ill and, uh, and passed away early in life, which left her 
uh, in, in financial hardship. We had sat down and talked and unbeknownst to her, uh, this young lady, did she know that through her husband's service, she was a, uh, who he had earned and was entitled to a level of benefits. It may have took some time, but through, through this posting and research, she was able to uh, receive a monthly stipend and health care. Uh, without this posting, she would have not known that she would have had that and she would have uh, struggled through a better part of her life. And um, now she's in a good place because of her, because of her husband's service. Um, I could go on and give you examples like that uh, over and over. Um, for myself, who a proud Air Force veteran, uh, son of a, an Army veteran in Vietnam War, and a grandson, both my granddads were in WW2. Um, as many of us know that come from a military-oriented family, uh, not having the proper information can, can lead to many uh, roadblocks in, in our life. Um, I can speak for my own father. Uh, he had a tremendous difficult time when he came home from Vietnam, which impacted not just him, but it impacted our home life as well. Uh, and I think that if at the time, if they would have had a posting that like this, that would have shown where an individual could have got the proper resources and assistance, who knows how other individuals, including my own life would have been changed. So uh, I, I, I just, and, and to earlier, you had mentioned what other states this has passed. I'd like to go to that. Um, I know it's New York, Minnesota, Maine, Rhode Island, Texas, Michigan, and it has been introduced in other states as Arkansas, Iowa, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, Virginia, uh, and New Hampshire. So I just wanted to share that information with you. Thank you. Sir, you just mentioned you're from New York, right? I am, sir, but I, I am, I, and I apologize, I am the United Steelworkers uh, District 4's uh, Veterans Coordinator, so I service all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware as a coordinator, yes, sir. No, I just wanted to apologize because I took a swipe at New York, so no disrespect. Ah, swipe there. away, it's okay. <laughs> um, I appreciate your testimony today, and needless to say, it's not, this is a, this is a really good bill. Um, so again, Rep, and everybody that's been here today testifying on it, and Appreciate you coming forward and testifying today. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, sorry. Questions? Please. Seeing none, you have a blessed day. Thank you. You as well. All right. I should have said this at the beginning. There's going to be names that come forward, and I've already done it a few times where I mess up the last name. So John Bonapane. 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 Okay. Welcome. The floor is yours. I don't think I can add a lot more than what, what's already been said. Um, I can kind of tell you about the steel workers and what I do. So I'm what's called a sub-district director, so I'm responsible for thousands of employees in all different types of industries. The steel workers represent people in state and municipal governments, manufacturing, utilities, bus drivers, I mean, you name it, we have people that we represent in all different types of jobs. And, I can relate one personal story, but I can tell you that as part of my job as sub-district director, I travel around the state and go to different local union meetings. And since I started this job, two things surprised me when I talked about this bill. One is when I ask people who are veterans in the room to raise their hands, I'm always surprised about how many people actually are veterans. Um, that surprised me personally. You may have the statistics, but I, you know, something I really didn't follow, to be honest. The second thing that surprised me when I brought this bill up at different union meetings is the real energetic support from people who aren't veterans. People really want to do things to help their veterans, and, and it, it's something that I'm proud of. Our brothers and sisters throughout this state really want to see this bill passed. And, and that's what I want to relay to you. And I, I heard all the support, and, 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 and that's great. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but I wanted to relay that to you. Um, one personal story that I actually just thought of as Tracy told her story about her father. Um, before I took this job, I didn't know each town had a veterans agent. I didn't know that. I actually re represent them now. But when I took the job, I went and 
talk to my mother about it because my father was a Korean War veteran. He's passed now almost 30 years. Um, and I said, you know, you should really reach out to them and talk to them about what's available to you. And she did. And she found out that there was a, a break on our real estate taxes. And, and I didn't know that. So when you talk about things like this that make people aware of what's out there, it's not just about veterans. It's about the families, too. And, and that's important. So I really want to thank you for your support on this. And, and I know this is, the, the, everybody said it. A lot of people that I talked to didn't even know this wasn't a law already and were surprised that it wasn't. So th thank you for all your support. Re really much appreciated. Thank you for your testimony. Questions, members of the committee? Appreciate you coming thank forward. You. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. We are going now back to S2489, and we have David Paul. David Paul. All righty. We will come back to you. Nathan Lowry, virtual. Hi, good afternoon. good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Nathan Lowry. I'm a Marine Corps veteran who served in Afghanistan, and I'm a current 303 student attorney with Harvard Law School's Veteran Legal Clinic. I've had the opportunity and the privilege of working with Mr. Ryan Costantino, who you'll hear from later today. Ryan's an Army veteran who served in Iraq, endured horrific trauma through intense combat that has forever changed him. He battles with both traumatic brain injury and PTSD from those experiences. And as you know, and as you've heard today, veterans like Ryan who've served in our nation's wars rely on the Chapter 115 benefits program in times of need. Yet, as Daniel Nagan noted earlier, there's a labyrinth of statutes and regulations that are dated, and as a result, this results in the turning away of very deserving applicants like Mr. Ryan Cosentino. In addition, in Ryan's case specifically, decisions will take months and even years at time to issue through various levels of appeal. Ryan specifically encountered also the difficulty in applying because of the current definition of veteran under the Chapter 115 regulations. As you heard earlier, the current Chapter 115 legislation presumptively excludes many of the veterans who receive less than honorable discharges from their final period of service. And that's regardless of any mitigating circumstances. Nationally, research has shown that there's a direct connection between PTSD, TBI, as well as an other than honorable discharge and the misconduct that leads to it. Ultimately, Massachusetts veterans like Ryan are those who really need these benefits and are in the most dire circumstances. And at both the federal VA level and in other states, as has been mentioned, veterans like Ryan who suffer from PTSD and TBI are afforded the opportunity to present mitigating evidence regarding both their meritorious circumstances uh, and their previous service, as well as the combat and violence they faced that ultimately led to misconduct. And it's really time for Massachusetts to do the same. So today's proposed legislation solves many of the problems that Ryan has faced and continues to face in his own quest to acquire benefits. Restructures the Chapter 115 appeals process to streamline it for faster decision making. And it also expands the benefit program to support veterans who previously been denied benefits because of other than other other than honorable discharges. Ultimately, what it does, it ensures that those who served our country in the most dire environments, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Somalia, or elsewhere, are cared for in Massachusetts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Questions from the committee? Thank you very much for coming forward today. Thank you. Next up, we have Ryan Constantino on S2489, virtual. Just lost your connection. They tried to get you back. Why couldn't they get you back? They wanted you to dial a number. Ryan Constantino. All right, we will come back. 
All right, next up we have Linda Louise Krapf, virtual. William LeBeau and Kenneth Walsh from the Massachusetts Veterans of Federal Foreign Wars. And we will go back to folks that weren't here right now. Morning. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Realis, uh, Rep. Cassidy, and committee members. Uh, you've already uh, heard from uh, I, heard. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. Keep going. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. My name is Kenneth Walsh. I'm the national aide de camp for the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Um, I assist the Department Commander for the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Massachusetts, Commander James Morrissey. Um, I am here um, on behalf of the Massachusetts Veteran of Foreign Wars to extend our, request our support for S2310 and H3503 as a reasonable and practical process to see how our Commonwealth can best institute substantive property tax relief for our veterans consistent with our strong support so we're linking that relief directly to the percentage of service-connected disability. The Massachusetts Veterans of Foreign Wars has been the strongest advocate for our Commonwealth for this reform, such as we call your attention that these bills currently do not have a member of our department as one of the appointments. We therefore call on the petitioners of this bill to add the Massachusetts Department of Veterans of Foreign Wars to the commission. The Massachusetts VFW supports any demonstrative efforts to provide financial and tax relief for veterans and supports the many bills taken up today that would increase the annuities for such relief. To include our strong support for H3506 and S2321, which would exclude health care cost payments to veterans from the gross household income calculations for 115 payments. The Massachusetts Veterans Foreign Wars supports H4021 in requiring employees to post information on veterans' benefits and services that as a, excuse me, services as a very welcome outreach strategy to help veterans. And furthermore, Massachusetts Veterans Foreign Wars would like to be on the record as stating that we are in full support of the governor's legislative package and consistent with the governor's proposals which we believe the administration and the Executive Office of Veteran Services should closely review for any modernization of Chapter 115, such as such those proposed by two, S2489 and H4152 before the general courts take any further action. Uh, myself personally, just to let you know, um, I am retired from the United States Air Force, I'm a lifelong resident of Massachusetts. Happy to see many union members here today. I'm a union steward myself. Um, I would like to say that um, personally I've seen um, multitudes of homeless veterans um, and former homeless veterans that we've served. Um, it's an honor to serve them when we see and find them. And we would like for you to please, um, as I've heard today, um, continue your support for these bills. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Villas, hey, Representative hey. Cassidy. Yep. This is Bill LaBelle, the state adjutant, VFW. Virtual. Yes. Virtual, sir. Yes, sir. I want to thank yourselves, a member of the committee, for having the VFW here today. Okay. Sorry, so, I'm muted. Okay, I'm um, sorry. I thought uh, Mr. Bolt, uh, Bill LaBelle has already spoken. <laughs> I should have stated at this time, I would like to pass the microphone over to the Massachusetts Department adjutant, Bill LaBelle, for questions. Um, my apologies, Mr. LaBelle. I thought you'd spoken earlier. Thank you. No, it's okay, Ken. Uh, we were speaking on, I spoke earlier on the bill. Still that Still muted, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank the committee again for hearing us out. Um, the VFW is in strong favor of the bills that are in front of you today, but we want to, as was stated in the opening statement, we want to emphasize that we should have a seat on that commission. Uh, the VFW has been involved for several years in trying to address uh, property tax issues for veterans, as as committee members know. So we definitely feel that we should have a seat at that uh, commission. Um, I mean, I know personally on one of the bills, I helped Senator Moore uh, write that bill and sponsor it. So 
And I know that there's a lot of different approaches to that problem, and we recognize that it's probably a good approach to have a committee or a commission look at all of those issues to try to come up with something to address that need. Um, bottom line, we do have veterans in an older population that are losing their homes because they can't afford property taxes who are also disabled. And it just seems that it, that Massachusetts should be able to do something about that. And that's why we're we're strongly supportive of the governor's initiative, the legislature, the Senate, um, whoever's going to address this, we definitely want to be part of that conversation. Uh, as far as the other bills you've heard today, we are strongly supporting everything that you've heard testifying because the bottom line is we've got to do better than what we've been doing. We're doing great on many levels, but on so many others we're not. And as testified earlier, you know, we don't want the 115 benefits to um, prevent a, a veteran from becoming homeless, which is the whole purpose of the 115, is to help them from becoming homeless. So um, we welcome any questions that anyone may have. Just some background for committee members who may be new and not know who the VFW is. Uh, we have 150 posts across the state of Massachusetts. We have 20,000 plus members of our, uh, members in auxiliary. All VFW members, Senator Villas is well aware of this, have served in combat. Um, that's under our congressional charter. That's why the definition is there. So we are the strongest advocate of com combat veterans in the state. We have a service office team that's covering geographically the whole state of Massachusetts in the last 12 months for VFW POA claims. That means the VFW initiated federal benefits. Our latest numbers, the last 12 months, $85 million has come into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts from POA VFW claims. That counts all claims. They could be 20 years old or they could be filed yesterday. But if we filed it, that's the number. And that's a huge improvement over where we were just six years ago when we were averaging about 10 million. So we're doing our part and we're asking the legislative to do your part in, in just continuing to make sure that our vulnerable veterans and veteran population are taken care of with these bills that are in front of you. Thank you for your time. Questions, members of the committee? Well, just to answer one of your questions, uh, the VFW will always have a, a seat at the table with this committee. We greatly appreciate the work of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. You folks are insightful on any number of issues, and we thank you for that. So seeing no questions, thank you very much for your testimony today. And just briefly recognizing my friend, Representative Kelly Pease, who has joined the hearing. David Paul. Continuing with S2489. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, my name is David Paul, and I'm a student at Harvard Law School, where I've had the honor and the privilege of advocating for Massachusetts veterans through the school's Veterans Law Clinic. Um, this includes representing a veteran who I believe you may have heard from earlier today, a uh, Chapter 115 benefit recipient who had lost his home and then lost his health when his benefits were abruptly cut off. Um, Michael's experience showcases the essential role that Chapter 115 benefits can play in many veterans' lives, as you're well aware, but it also showcases the urgently needed reforms. Um, specifically in Michael's harrowing experience underscores the need for veterans to continue to receive their Chapter 115 benefits anytime their eligib eligibility is being reassessed, and the need for greater authority at the agency level to expedite appeals and to issue payments when local VSOs are unfortunately acting contrary to the law. Um, Michael is a U.S. Army veteran, served honorably in the late 1970s, including service on the Korean Peninsula, where part of his uh, assignment was to take care of injured soldiers. Um, Michael started receiving Chapter 115 benefits in 2019, and in early 2021, a new VSO began requesting additional documentation, even though nothing about Michael's circumstances had changed. Um, despite his best efforts at compliance, the VSO ended up terminating Michael's benefits on November 11, 2021, which of course was Veterans Day. Um, after much unsuccessful back and forth, Michael did file an appeal with, the, with EOVS in August of 2022, which was nine months after he'd been cut off. And in January of this year, 13 months after he was cut off, EOVS ruled in Michael's favor. But despite EOVS ordering the VSO to pay him the money he was owed, the VSO continued not to do so, and Michael had to file suit in Superior Court to enforce EOVS's own order against its own VSO. 17 months 
of no Chapter 115 benefits left their mark on Michael. He couldn't afford rent, and he was homeless, and his health, including his cancer, deteriorated during that time. Michael's harrowing experience could have been avoided if three simple safeguards had been in place. State law should have guaranteed Michael the right to receive his benefits at the original level while his situation was under review. The appeals mechanism should not have taken five months to get to a ruling. And EOVS should be required to take action when it's apparent that a VSO is defying its orders. These simple changes are obviously just a small slice of the important information and the important improvements that are before you today. But as you can see from Michael's case in particular, such small changes do have the power to save and sustain lives. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony today. Questions, members of the committee? Appreciate you coming forward today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. All next up, Michael Raymond, virtual. Alrighty, we will loop back around. Next up, Patrick George and Mike Sweeney. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, other members of the committee. My name is Patrick George. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Veterans Service Officers Association. Unfortunately, what we've heard today are two very contrasting opinions of individuals and their VSOs. The Massachusetts Veterans Service Officers Association is our goal is to bridge that gap and to ensure that veterans have positive experience with their VSOs by the uniform application of Chapter 115 as regulated by EOVS. A lot of the policy changes and proposals that we've heard today are subject to our MVSOA legislative agenda. Uh, not all of those bills are on today's hearing. However, a lot of the ideas ranging from improved outreach to the exclusion of Chapter 115 uh, for housing determination is part of our legislative agenda, and we'd be happy to share that with you as we get closer to that. I do want to speak on behalf of Senate Bill 2344 and 2347, two bills filed by Senator Rush. Uh, both of those bills address widows and dependents of veterans. As it was discussed earlier, veteran service officers' jobs do not stop with the passing of a veteran. We are here to support the family members as well. These two bills will bridge that gap and will allow us to ensure that we can provide benefits to widows and spouses in circumstances that really have no, that they may not have any control over. Uh, I would like to thank my colleague, Mike Sweeney, both of us Afghanistan veterans uh, having served uh, for joining us as well. I think I met Mike about six or seven years ago when I was a staffer hiding in the back of one of these hearing rooms. And uh, six or seven years later, here we are uh, advocating for legislation on, uh, together as a team for the MVSOA. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Chairman Vilas, Chairman Cassidy. Uh, members of the committee. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, to begin with, I, I'd like to uh, speak on behalf for the MVSOA of uh, House Bill 4021, filed by uh, uh, my good friend, our Army veteran, uh, Representative Pete Capano. Um, I think it's one of those ideas that may sound like common sense, I know we all, but it certainly isn't. It, for, every organ, for every company, every employer over 50 people to have a, a poster telling people where they're uh, where they can get help. That, it's just common sense, but obviously it hasn't been done, and I want to thank uh, the representative for bringing that forward. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, AFL-CIO, uh, the, the steel workers, and for really, uh, these are the things that come up that I really think do matter. I think we won't know how many people really get benefits from this, but I think it's, um, it's th those things that are impossible to, to quantify, but just the right thing to do, and we know it will help. So thank you with that. Um, secondly, I want to, if I could touch a, a little bit on the um, on the, on the, uh, and just to reiterate to the, to the legislature, to the committee uh, in, spe in specific, that the MVSOA is here. We're a partner. We'd like to work with the legislature to find any to, to, to uh, streamline, to improve Chapter 115. I think I can say um, with all humility that there would not be a Chapter 115 program to, in, to uh, improve if we're not for the MVSOA and the work with the legislature. It would be gone. I think a little history is important. The idea that in town halls and city halls, you used to have the welfare department next to the veteran services department. The reason we're still there, the reason this program is still at a local level, was not by accident. 
because what we believe is that if it became a state program, it would leak, uh, eventually go away. It would be a checkoff box at DTA. And, and we believe, and I think we prove day in, day out as VSOs, uh, that the, the people who come in our office get more than just the benefits. Having that veteran in their community at the local level, someone they can come and talk to. Um, having said that, we are here to improve the program. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear about um, issues that come up. We would argue sometimes that the, if one person is making a mistake, that's a management issue. When multiple people are making the same mistake, that's a training problem. And what I would point to uh, respectfully is uh, in the budget every year, line item 1400024. It's a line item for training for VSOs. Uh, every year we advocated that is a, a line item that would not exist if it were not for the advocacy of the MVSOA along with our great friends in the legislature. Um, this year alone is $370,000 in there. We would like that to be something that people talk about maybe making a more robust training program. Um, but again, we, we stand ready to be at the table. Uh, I think there's no Chapter 115 reform that comes through that is not only successful to be passed, but frankly to be implemented without VSOs at the table. We really do, and I think sometimes we have VSOs that, uh, um, if you look at some of the, um, the uh, issues that are being brought up, they're terrible and, and they're wrong. And uh, I've had the, the, the pleasure of working with uh, Attorney Nagin on, on cases, and I think we've talked about it, where sometimes some of the issues you run into where the VSO is frankly just relaying the law as presented to us by EOVS. And they are they're good faith actors on all states. They just believe they're in. In, in fact, uh, I, was the, uh, I was shocked to hear that when this gentleman was told by his VSO that the community would not pay, that, EO, that DVS, I believe it was at the time, did not make the payment. My understanding in the 20 years I've been in the job is that if the community does not make the payment, the Commonwealth had the legal right to pay that, that veteran directly, and that would come out of the cherry sheet in the next year for the veteran. And I believe EOVS believes maybe the law isn't, doesn't not give them that authority, but it's not through lack of imagination. That, this is not a new issue, and that should have been taken care of uh, quickly and frankly I would argue that that veteran that that office should be considered out of compliance and that is something as well that EOVS has the right to then put that that town into a, a, a lower level of reimbursement so we're here to work I'll tell you um, many of our VSOs are are, uh, are working hard and uh, I think what we really want to do is uh, just sit down at the table and make sure that we get this right um, with the understanding, and I think we say this a lot, that as much as this is an emergency, we want to measure twice and cut once. We don't want to have to go, if we do this again in the next uh, go around. Um, a good example of that is how certification is now the law in Massachusetts for VSOs. Um, not to go back in the way back machine, but I'm old enough to remember when the administration at the time was opposed to that. It was the MVSOA, along with our friends in the legislature, and um, he uh, he's already uh, had to go to another hearing, but Senator Mike Rush, that was his bill that we put through, that we were able to make it so veterans agents and veteran service officers in the Commonwealth are certified. We worked with them. We're happy to do it again. We're proud to do it again, to work with the legislature, the administration, and any advocates. Uh, as I said, I believe everyone's heart's in the right place. I think we all want the same thing, um, at least in this room, and I think what we want to do is uh, maybe we can get to the table and figure out differences of perspective to make sure that the program does work with veterans and their families and for Gold Star families. So with that, um, I'll end my testimony and just say thank you for having us here again, and if uh, you have any questions, we're, we're available. Questions, members of the committee? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Just uh, to commend both of you, I was there Saturday in Boston when you were both honored by the governor for your service to our Commonwealth um, and for stepping up today to uh, explain and defend and participate. I know that as a state representative, when I have any questions about a veteran issue, which are complicated, and you're right, many people don't even know about a VSO. I go right to the VSOs on the Cape and they make that contact and they change lives. So I thank you both for what you do, what your families do, and um, look forward to working more together in the future. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I just want to echo the sentiments of, of uh, my colleague here. I'm well aware of the, the work that, that you do, uh, Mike, and uh, very appreciate it. You can always and also be a thankless job at times, so, but you hang in there. And I appreciate you 
coming, uh, driving all the way to Lynn uh, when we met uh, Secretary Santiago. You know, so I, I know it would, besides the day-to-day -day things that, that you all do, you're strong advocates for veterans, and I appreciate that, and you should be recognized for that. Thank you. And gentlemen, it's just not that. You, you go beyond, right? I just recently, a road race not too long ago, I saw you at. Um, Pretty sure you ran and you did not run. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just kidding. Um, but you folks go above and beyond in, in any issue that touches on these subject matters. I think it goes without saying that you folks need to be at the table. So we appreciate your advocacy. Um, always there, willing to chat. Always want to have conversations um, far beyond both of your respective communities. So appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Senator. All right, we're going to try again. Ryan Constantino, virtual. How about Linda Louisa Crap? Afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you? No. Can Hello? you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? You're muted, ma'am. And now it says I'm unmuted. You're, we can hear you now. You're good. Thank you. Floor is yours. Yes, hi. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm listening to all these um, wonderful testimonies. I'd like to just state that the standardized application would have helped uh, Michael Mimna. I am his home health aide and was with him during his struggle to find um, to help with the chapter 115. And it took months to get a, to a accidentally run across the Harvard Law team who has been fighting for Michael and finally won his um, back pay. But the standardized filing would have helped with the um, need for want, the BSO wanting all this extra paperwork that wasn't required. and. During this, Michael has been reaching out to other vets, and and um, we run across many vets and um, their families that don't know about the program. And he's been spreading the word about the program from town to town. And today, we went to the fuel assistance and ran across a, a spouse of a deceased veteran that had no idea about the program and is struggling. And we've run into homeless vets. And the, the need to get the knowledge out on this wonderful program and um, it, it, it is in, indeed a, a, a great thing to be working on. And I'd like to thank everybody um, for their effort in this in this case. And I'd like to also report that Michael is in a town with a wonderful BSO and it is such a wonderful asset and just so w proud that um, this state is offering this to our vets. And I, I just like to thank you for that. We thank you for testifying today. Questions, members of the committee? All righty, thank you very much for your testimony today. Have a great day. How about Michael Raymond? Michael Raymond? Ryan Constantino? Anybody else who's here who hasn't testified that wants to testify? Seeing no one moving to adjourn. <laughs>